Most of us know that what people post on social media is just the highest of highlights in a person's life. Most people want the world around them to think that they have it all. The perfect family, the best husband or wife, the cutest, smartest kids, and the most money. Most people do not post when they're going through hardships. They don't post the low points of their lives. No one wants the world to see when they are in incredible amounts of debt. They only want people to see their nice car, their nice house, and their luxury vacations. But I know, and so many of us know and recognize, that what people post on social media is oftentimes a big fat lie, or at the very least, an exaggeration of how good their life actually is. That was the reality for Leanne and Darren McKee. Even though they appeared to have the expensive, upper-middle-class lifestyle that anybody could dream of, the truth is, there was something much more sinister going on behind the scenes. Leanne McKee was the 39-year-old mother of three children, all between the ages of 2 to 11, George, Claudia, and Tallulah, and she had a husband, 43-year-old Darren McKee. The family lived in Wimslow, England, and both Leanne and Darren worked for the Greater Manchester Police. The two had met at work and had been married for the 13 years that followed. At the time, Leanne worked part-time as a detective constable with the Sexual Offenses Unit, while Darren worked as a police officer. Both Leanne and Darren were well-respected members of the force, known for doing great work to keep their communities safe. Leanne was known to be kind, loving, and generous. She was known to have the best smile and never had a bad word to say about anybody. Leanne was known to absolutely love her family. Even as a woman in her late 30s, she was still in constant contact with her parents, Ellen and Ray, who she spoke to on a daily basis. Leanne was also the most loving mother that you could hope for. Her children were her world, and she worked hard to provide them with the best possible life that she could. To those on the outside, Leanne and Darren had it all. They had frequently uploaded photos of the couple going out to nice dinners, the family going on nice vacations, and spending quality time as a family unit. They drove expensive cars, they lived in a luxury home, and all the children were all involved in after-school curriculars such as ballet tennis, and cricket. At the time, the family was also working on renovations to the home. Some parts of the house needed renovations, while other renovations were done to spruce up the place and give it a more luxurious look. They got granite countertops, new windows all throughout the home, in-floor heating, and new bathroom fixtures, all while continuing to go on their expensive vacations. Their lifestyles did not slow down during these renovations, and the family continued living lavishly. However, behind the scenes, it turned out that the family was living far beyond their means. Now, back in the years prior to 2016, the couple had been living in a home which they also needed to renovate to sell. Of note, all of the amounts that have been reported that the couple were spending, I did convert from pounds to US dollar because most of my audience is from the US and so am I, so I felt that converting the amounts was the best for my brain to fully understand the numbers, of course, it might be slightly off because this all took place in 2016 and 2017, and obviously I'm converting them to dollars today. So hopefully inflation hasn't been that bad. That makes that much of a difference, but if it has, I do apologize. It just works best for my brain to understand how much money we're talking if it is in the currency that I use. Either way, through all of the renovations for the first house, Leanne and Darren's parents helped with the costs of the renovations, providing them with a combined amount of $112,000 throughout that time. They had also helped Darren pay off a credit card, which he had racked up a $49,000 debt on. But this turned out well for everybody because in September of 2016, Darren and Leanne sold their house and pocketed $187,000, which they were then able to put towards their next home. Now, when they moved into their new $500,000 home, they did have certain renovations that they needed to do to make the home livable. But again, they were paying for renovations that they didn't necessarily need at the same time as getting the needed renovations. So for example, they didn't need new granite countertops, but that cost them almost $5,000. They also didn't need new windows all throughout the home, 
which cost them $7,000. They didn't necessarily need new bathrooms, which cost them $6,000. So they were paying a ton of extra money for renovations that they didn't necessarily need, while also putting up the money for renovations that they did need. Then, while doing some of these renovations, they were also renting a house to live in temporarily while the renovations were taking place, which cost them another $1,800 each month. So, they spent all of that money on renovations, as well as rent for the temporary house and their new mortgage for the house that they now bought. Their monthly expenses were pretty astronomical during that time and greatly exceeded what they were taking home from their jobs. Between the two of them, they were making about $5,000 per month, but what they were spending was exceeding that by almost $1,200 in some months. One year, they spent almost $70,000 more than they earned. Then that summer, after having all of these insane expenses with the renovations and the new home and all of that, the family still took a trip to Portugal, which cost them another $7,000. During this time, it was stated that Leanne was the one who was in charge of their finances, so for a few years, it appeared to Leanne that Darren was bringing in enough money to support everything that they were doing. But by the summer of 2017, Leanne started to notice that things were not as good financially as she had been led to believe. They had run about $40,000 over budget with the renovations and contractors were demanding payment, which they simply could not afford. During that time, Darren had severely overdrawn his bank account and Leanne knew about it, but he assured her that he was taking care of it. In a panic, he started applying for different loans, trying to recoup the money, but he was continuously being denied. Of course, when you have so much debt and you probably don't have a great credit score, you're not gonna be given very many loans. In total, he applied for 15 different loans under his own name pretty much in the same day to pay back all of the debts that he had racked up. By August of 2017, he applied to borrow $10,000 from an AA loan, which is a personal loan. But this time, the bank actually sent a letter to the home, which had the information about the loan and why he was rejected. Leanne ended up opening the letter, and that is when she found out about him trying to take out these loans, because he didn't tell her that he was taking out all of these loans. He didn't tell her how much of a hole he had gotten them into. She was completely in the dark about him applying to these loans until she saw this letter. After seeing the rejection letter, she sent Darren an email asking him why he was applying for loans. Darren actually completely denied applying for a loan and told Leanne that somebody had been using his identity to fraudulently take out loans in his name. Of course, this concerned Leanne, so she went to the bank to ask about the loan and let them know that it wasn't actually Darren trying to take them out. After that conversation, the bank sent out another letter, but this time, Darren was able to grab the letter before Leanne could see it. Around the same time, on August 31st, 2017, Darren applied for a $67,000 loan, basically by taking out a second mortgage on their home. Leanne did not know about this loan application either. However, because both his and Leanne's name were on the home, the application was made in both of their names. In order to get the loan, the banks would need documentation from both of them, including pay stubs with both salaries on them, again, to make sure that they were making enough money to pay back the loan. Again, with these loans, Darren did not want Leanne to know about any of it. So instead of telling her about what was going on, because they both worked at the same police department, Darren was actually able to use a work computer to access Leanne's pay information and obtained copies of her pay stub that way. There was some excuse that he gave for why he needed her username and password, and after that, he was able to obtain her information pretty easily. Then, when he was speaking with the broker and going through the process of getting the loan, Darren actually gave a false email and phone number for Leanne so that they wouldn't actually be contacting her. The phone number he gave for Leanne was actually for a phone that he kept in his office, which Leanne did not have access to. 
so there was no way that someone would be calling her up and asking her about the loan. Then, the next step for applying for this loan and being granted was that Darren had to mail his and his wife's passports to the loan company for official identification. The company got the passports, checked them, and then mailed them back to the home, along with a copy of the loan application the following day. But the mail carrier couldn't just drop them off, they had to be signed for, and that is what Leanne did. She received the envelope and she signed off on it. By the morning of September 28th, 2017, Leanne opened that envelope and found that both her and Darren's passports and that loan application with both their names on it were inside. At the time, Darren was at work while Leanne was at home. She was also scheduled to work that evening, starting by 3 p.m. that same day. After opening the package by 11.22 a.m., she texted Darren immediately. She already had a good idea of what was going on. She pretty much knew that he took out a loan using her name without telling her. In one text message, she wrote to Darren, you liar, just got back a loan application with my passport and my name, WTF. She texted again saying, are we in such a mess? Why again? He wasn't answering her multiple text messages, so she tried calling him multiple times as well, but she wasn't answering any of them. According to Darren, he said that he was in a meeting at the time. He said that he could have answered the texts and calls, but he chose not to because he knew that if he answered, he would be met with an angry wife who couldn't be reasoned with, and obviously that's not something that he could be dealing with while in a meeting. So, he waited until after he was out of the meeting to respond to her. Once he was out of the meeting, he texted her at 11.32 a.m. saying that he was now on his way home. He assured her that he hadn't been answering just because he was in that meeting. After informing her that he was on his way home, according to Darren, she texted him that she was scared. To him, he thought that she meant that she was scared of the debt that they were in, not of him or of him coming home. Now, Darren was set to leave early from work that day regardless of this angry exchange of text messages because he had been scheduled to meet a loan company surveyor at the home at 1.30 p.m. He was going to carry out the mortgage valuation. But according to Darren, by the time he got home, Leanne was not there. So, he started sending her text messages, asking her where she was, saying that he was worried about her. At the time, the valuer carried out his inspection as planned. Then, an hour later, he left the home and picked his children up from school just after 3 p.m. When picking up his kids, according to the other parents there, Darren acted completely normally. He was talking and chatting with the other parents as he normally did when he picked the kids up. After that, he took the kids home for their after-school tea and some snacks before driving them to their extracurricular activities. By 10.30 p.m., the kids were in bed and asleep. But during that entire time, Leanne had not returned back home and Darren started to get even more worried. So, after the kids went to bed, according to Darren, he went out on a walk to look around for his missing wife. He spent hours doing this, somehow ending up almost six miles away from his home. By 1.30 a.m. going into the next morning on September 29th, two police officers on patrol noticed Darren. They had been on patrol looking for some home burglars, so they felt that they should stop Darren and speak with him since he was alone and walking around aimlessly. At the time, Darren told officers that he was walking home, which was close by. Again, this was a lie. He was six miles away from home. He was not close by, but he told the officers that his home was very close and that he was almost there. The officers didn't have any reason to question him at that time, so they let him continue on. He continued on walking towards his home. However, after walking a few miles, the two officers saw Darren once again and this time, he was actually closer to his home, but he was not wearing shoes. So, officers found him highly suspicious at that point. Not only had he lied an hour or so prior, saying that he was close to his home when he wasn't, but now he was still out walking around, looking dirty, and wearing no shoes. He was wearing only his socks. By that point, officers stopped him once again, and this time, he told the officers that he too was a cop. 
He said that he was out looking for his missing wife, fearing that she may have been injured in an accident after she failed to return home from her work shift. He said that he was walking and not driving because he had drank a bottle of wine earlier and didn't want to risk driving. The officers then said that they were going to take him home, which they did. As they were driving home, he acted very anxious, saying that he was worried about his missing wife, wondering what could have happened to her. They suggested that he try calling her again, so he did, but it went straight to voicemail, so he left her a voicemail. After that, the two officers dropped him off at home. He went inside and he put his clothes in the washing machine because they were dirty from him, being outside and walking around all night. He started the cycle and then went to bed. By that point, the children had been home alone while Darren wandered around outside for about four hours. After dropping Darren off at the home, the two officers did want to inquire further about his wife's disappearance since he appeared so worried about her well-being. However, just a few minutes after those officers returned to the police station to start their inquiry, they were informed that a woman's body had been found in Poynton Lake in Poynton, England. The woman had been found face down in the water just near the shore of the lake. Then, right near that lake, they spotted a car, a red mini countryman. When they ran the plates on that car, they realized that the car belonged to Leanne McKee. Then they were able to identify the body as belonging to Leanne McKee. Now, Poynton Lake is just about six miles away from Darren and Leanne's home and was the same area where those two patrol officers found Darren walking around aimlessly. It doesn't take a genius to make that connection between this man who was walking around aimlessly in the middle of the night to the location where his wife was found dead. So immediately after finding Leanne's body, by 5 a.m. on September 29th, officers returned to Darren's home and arrested him on suspicion of murder. When they took Darren into the station for questioning, he gave the same story that I just told. That he got home from work, she wasn't there, so he went out and started searching for her, worried sick about what could have happened. He said that he had absolutely no idea that she had died, but police did not believe him when he said that she wasn't home when he got there. So after being pressed further, Darren did change his story a bit. He was now saying that Leanne was home when he got there. He admitted that the two got into an argument when he got home and that resulted in them driving off in the red mini countryman. But he said that the two drove away together in that same car but he ended up dropping Leanne off, I guess near that lake somewhere, and then returned back home without Leanne to speak with the mortgage valuer because Leanne didn't want to be involved in their financial issues. He didn't say why both of them took the same car if they were just going to separate because they did both have their own cars. Don't know why he would have dropped her off instead of just bringing her back so she could drive off in the car while he stayed at home with his car. That didn't really make any sense. He basically said that he dropped her off there and that he left her there and then she wasn't there when he went back to get her for whatever reason. He said that that is when he hadn't seen Leanne ever again and he didn't know what happened to her and he couldn't find her after that. However, as police investigated further, it became painfully obvious what was actually going on here. After the discovery of Leanne's body, she was sent off to the medical examiner for an autopsy. And what they found was that Leanne had suffered from a brutal, violent death. They found that she had extensive bruising around her neck and two structural bones in her neck had been fractured as well. They found that she also had bruising around the inside of her mouth and lips. So based on these findings, the medical examiner determined that she died as a result of strangulation after someone applied significant pressure to her neck, causing those bruises. And then they covered her mouth to prevent her from screaming, which caused those bruises in her mouth and on her lips. According to the ME, he believes that she was strangled for at least one minute before her death. She had been brutally murdered. Then to continue their investigation, of course, police looked into Darren and Leanne's cell phone data. They found those text messages on the morning before Leanne went missing on September 28th. However, Darren actually tried to delete certain texts from his phone. 
They also saw that he had been texting Leanne all day, asking her where she was and that he was worried about her. They found that he had called her multiple times after he said she went missing, all trying to figure out where she went. But of course, they found the text messages where Leanne was calling him a liar and was calling him out for what he had done. And once again, those had been deleted off of Darren's phone, but were still present in Leanne's cell phone data. Then police used this cell phone data as well as some CCTV footage to compile a timeline of everything that Darren did that day. As we know, by 11 a.m. that morning, the two got into a fight over text message, and by 11.32 a.m., he texted her that he was returning home. Police believe that it was sometime between 11.30 a.m. and 1 p.m. after he returned home, but before the surveyor arrived, that that is when some sort of altercation broke out and Darren strangled Leanne. After strangling her, they believed that he put her into the footwell of her red mini countryman. He then drove the car a short distance away within the same neighborhood and parked the car somewhere he didn't think it would be noticed. Then he walked back to the home, which was caught on CCTV footage, and then he had that meeting with the surveyor. After the inspection, they believe that he returned back to the car by walking over to it and then drove around in the surrounding countryside, looking for a suitable area to dump her body. At the time, he had both Leanne's and his own cell phone with him. The cell phones confirmed that he was in the area of Paddock Hill Farm for a few minutes at around 2.40 p.m. In this location, police noted that there was a public house that Darren was familiar with. There were signs in the area warning of water flooding in a wooded area. That made them think that Darren saw this as the perfect dumping spot. He then left the area, returning the car to another part in the neighborhood to park it somewhere inconspicuous. He then walked back to his home again, and by 3 p.m., he got in his own car and picked the kids up from school. Once again, he was acting completely normally as he did every day, according to witnesses. By 10.30 p.m., once the kids were in bed and asleep, Darren left the house. He walked to the area where he parked the red mini countryman, which still contained Leanne's body. She had been in that car for about nine hours at that point. Of note, this time, Darren did not bring his cell phone with him to continue carrying out his plans. But according to Leanne's cell phone data, he returned back to that area near Paddock Hill Farm, remaining there for only a few minutes. According to police, they believe that Darren realized that the water there would not be deep enough to dispose of her body because, again, he saw that there were signs for flooding in the wooded area, so maybe he thought that this would be enough to make it look like she drowned or had an accident, but when he got there, he realized that the flooding wasn't as bad as he was hoping. So, he ended up not actually dumping her body there, but he did leave her phone there. Now, police weren't sure whether he deliberately threw it there, but they think it's more likely that he accidentally dropped it there because it wouldn't make sense that her phone was in a different location than where her body was if he was trying to make it look like she died in an accident or something. Either way, they don't have cell phone data to confirm his next moves, but they believe that he drove around for quite a while trying to find somewhere else to dispose of her body before deciding on Poynton Lake. Once again, he left the home at 10.30 p.m. and police saw him walking away from the area of the lake at 1.30 a.m., so he had most likely been driving around aimlessly for hours trying to find a new spot. Once at Poynton Lake, they believed that he parked her car nearby and dragged her body 140 yards along a path until he found a spot to dump her body in the lake. They believe that he attempted to stage the scene to look like she accidentally drowned or was attacked by a random stranger. After dumping her body, he started walking the six miles down the street to return back home. But as we know, he was stopped by police at 1.30 a.m. 
It turned out that after being stopped by police, Darren most likely realized that he needed to get rid of the shoes he was wearing because they were heavily stained with Leanne's blood and other bodily fluids that came out while he was handling her body after death. Because again, she was murdered by being strangled. She wasn't bleeding when she was killed, so that is really the only explanation for how blood got on his shoes, was that it was coming out after her death. Once Darren was close enough to the home, he threw his shoes into a nearby trash bin, hoping that the trash would be collected before anyone was the wiser. But, of course, they were ultimately found. From that trash bin, he started walking the rest of the way home in his socks. Again, that is when the same officer stopped him for a second time. In my opinion, he probably waited until he was pretty close to the home to dump the shoes because they probably thought, like, if I do it right away after these police saw me, they might see me again in the same area and will be suspicious if I'm not wearing shoes. So he probably thought that these police officers wouldn't see him again and thought that he could make it the short distance home in just his socks because it would be very strange if anybody saw him wearing just his socks. But again, he was spotted like that. So it was very suspicious. Again, those officers saw him, they drove him home, and he washed his clothes to get rid of the evidence, and then he went to bed. So, based on everything that I have discussed up to this point, police felt confident that they had enough to officially charge Darren McKee with the first-degree murder of his wife, Leanne McKee. He pleaded not guilty, continuing to claim that he had nothing to do with his wife's death, saying that a stranger must have murdered her while she was out by the lake by herself. Darren's trial for murder started by March of 2018. The prosecution first talked about the immense amount of debt that the family was in. They ended up spending about $78,000 on home renovations. That was in addition to the $6,000 that they spent on their summer vacation in Portugal. In total, they had built up about $140,000 of debt over the course of eight years. They talked about how Darren was desperate to prevent Leanne from finding out about all of the debt they were in, so he applied for over a dozen loans under his own name, all of which were rejected. So, he fraudulently applied for a bigger loan under both of their names, hoping that Leanne would not find out. He had not planned on the package with the passports arriving to the home while he was at work. So, when Leanne found out about what he was doing and confronted him, calling him a liar, you know, saying all of these things, there was probably a huge argument, he snapped. They argued that Darren was afraid that he would lose everything, his job, his reputation, his family, if Leanne decided to report him for fraudulently applying for a loan in her name. So, he drove home, an argument ensued, probably a very heated one, and he ended up strangling her. We don't necessarily know if he went home with the intention of strangling her, or if the fight broke out and it turned physical and that's what resulted. But either way, the fact that he strangled her for over a minute, that shows a level of premeditation that he started and had time to stop to, you know, get up and be like, I can't believe I just did that and end up not killing her. There was time for him to decide not to kill her, but he continued strangling her for over a minute, which showed that he intentionally ended her life. Leanne was much smaller than Darren, and Darren actually had a background of doing martial arts, so he easily would have overpowered her. Then he used his knowledge and skills as a police officer to try and cover up his tracks. He took every step he could think of to cover up what he did. But as chance would have it, those patrol officers happened to be out and happened to notice him. The prosecution conceded that if it wasn't for those officers, it would have been very difficult to prosecute this case. They said that in the days and weeks after murdering his own wife and the mother of his children, he showed absolutely no remorse. Now, Darren spent the entire time leading up to the trial, as well as the first week or so of the trial, claiming total innocence. However, after hearing all of the evidence against him, he actually asked for a plea of manslaughter. He was now claiming that he never meant to kill his wife. 
He said that an argument broke out, things escalated, and he accidentally killed her, but he never meant to. But it seemed that the prosecution felt that it was too little, too late to try and argue this. They said that if he truly felt bad about what he did, if it truly was an accident, any decent person would have taken their dying wife to the hospital or call 911 immediately to report what happened. But he didn't do that. He carefully planned how he was going to dispose of her body, how he was going to cover up what he did. He made no effort to try and help his wife after killing her or in the process of strangling her. And to the prosecution, that said that he intentionally killed his wife. After three weeks of trial, the jury was sent off for their deliberations. They deliberated for nine hours before they came back with their verdict. They found that Darren McKee was guilty of murdering his wife. While reading out the verdict, Darren closed his eyes but remained emotionless. For this, the judge sentenced him to life in prison with a minimum of 19 years served before he will be eligible for parole. He's shown no emotion. Uh, he's shown no emotion whilst in custody. He's shown no emotion whilst at court. Um, he's completely, I think, distanced himself from the reality of what he's done. We don't actually know his reason why, uh, because he's not told us whilst he's been uh, in custody. Uh, and he certainly didn't tell us whilst on interview. Um, everything pointed towards the fact that they were in financial difficulties. So, that is all of the information that I have for today's case. This is yet another case of a man who does some wild shit behind his wife's back, and then when she starts to find out what he's done, he takes the life of his wife, ruins his own life, as well as the lives of his children, all because he couldn't man up and admit to what happened and work with his wife to find a solution. It genuinely makes no sense to me how these people think that this is the best option somehow. Obviously, most people, I guess anybody who commits a crime, they think that they will never be caught. But as an officer, even if he wasn't caught, he still has to know that he will be investigated. He will have to deal with the stress of being looked into by police. They will find all of the financial troubles that he's in and... Loan companies might find out that he's in the middle of an investigation and will probably continue to deny him, so he won't have any money to pay back his debts anyways. And he will spend the rest of his life worrying about what police know, if they're going to arrest him, if they're investigating him, etc. Then, even beyond a police investigation and that stress, he will have to deal with explaining to his young children where their mother is deal with the stress that comes with the children grieving. He will have to explain to family members and friends what happened for the rest of his life and continuously live his life in a lie. Even if you commit a crime like this and you are never caught, how is that less stressful than figuring out a way to pay back your debts? How is that less stressful than working with your wife to figure this out? How is that even less stressful than a divorce? It never makes sense. It never will make sense. And people that think of doing this need to realize that they probably will be caught. And even if they're not, the paranoia and stress that comes with this entire situation with the police investigation and the possibility of one day being found, it's so much more stressful than a divorce ever will be. My heart absolutely aches for those children who lost both of their parents. As far as I've seen, they are now being raised by Leanne's parents. And I hope that even Darren's parents get to be involved because I'm sure they didn't know what was going on and hopefully didn't support what Darren did. 
I don't know much about his parents, but unless they're like Chris Watts' parents who are like, oh, he's innocent and he couldn't have possibly done this, as long as they're not completely delusional like that, I hope that they got to stay involved with those children because they need as much family as they can have after what they had to go through. I'm sure that Darren is not having the best time in prison given that he was a police officer putting people there, so I'm sure life for him is pretty wild on the inside. But that is all the information that I have for today's video. And now I want to know what you all think. Why do you think this happened? Was it because of the money issues or do you think there was more going on that we just don't know about? Why do you think he chose to kill her instead of just dealing with these issues head on? Because in my opinion, the issues that they had weren't that bad to constitute killing someone, but obviously he thought differently. Let's discuss any and all thoughts that you have on this case in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.